Hello, we're at Global Exchange here in San Francisco. And this is your live streamer for Van uh, We'll be getting started pretty soon. We have uh, Billy Nesson over here who will be speaking to us this evening. So we're looking forward to that. And uh, Billy is a uh, organizer, journalist, filmmaker, and he's here to talk about his experiences. Uh, in Indonesia, organizing here in the Bay Area. And uh, here's a handout. It says uh, Billy Nelson is a longtime activist, most recently working with UC Berkeley students, the fossil free cow, to demand that the region stay best from big oil, coal, and natural gas. Nessa, the leader of the student anti-apartheid divestment movement in Berkeley in the 80s, will give us a history of his movements he's involved in from protests at the Concord Never Weapons Station against shipping weapons to El Salvador to his role as a journalist who was captured in the East Timor independence struggle. Steve Jacobson and Earth First and Occupy will interview Billy to bring his work to light, and we may be seeing excerpts from his film, The Black Road. And, uh, Bill is here to talk about on uh, Wednesday there's going to be a nighttime march in Berkeley to end investment in fossil fuel. And that's Wednesday, November 12th, 9 p.m. And we're going to meet up at Telegraph and Bancroft. And for all of you out of the city, you know that I will be live streaming that event. Uh, and there you go. So we should be getting started here in just a couple of minutes. Started here for people that are just joining us. Billy's the gentleman on the left hand side of the screen, and he's the gentleman who'll be speaking tonight. We're at anarchist time, so everything's a little bit late. You look like you're ready for, you look like you're going back to the East Coast. You know, I got to keep yeah, going. Yeah, the line is over there. 
thing we're loving. Good people have a campaign. I keep my ear going all the time. People come in and say, man, it's hot. Uh, I really belong to be in my tropics. That's a phone, I mean. Yeah. But the problem is the lighter something is, the more it moves with the slightest motion, right? That's why you, you have the monopod. It does well enough. It's more of a question of the uh, your signal, your cell phone tower. We're the cell phone tower. Okay, yeah, it works. Okay, so let's turn it on. All right. We're excited. We're here with Billy Nesson at Global Exchange. Occupy Forum. So now, what time started. is it? Six thirty. Yep. So we're running a half an hour late, but that's okay. Yeah. Nobody on chat yet. I think I have to restructure what's going on. So next night I'll be out is on Wednesday. At the, that'll be at this March. Actually, I'm I'm really interested in seeing what a 9 p.m. March looks like in Berkeley uh, this Wednesday. So look for me. That's 9 p.m. Pacific time. As always, these uh, live streams are archived at youtube.com slash user slash Freeman Sullivan. And we're going to get started for those of you just joining us in a minute. If you have any questions uh, that you'd like to ask Billy, uh, log on to the chat. I like this. Don't even think about it. That's good. Absolutely. So how's life treating you down in San Diego? It's good. It's good there for me. I'm not. Um, I'm not interacting with many people. I just with my family. Trying to work on my book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. 
family here and there and paying the bills and all that. I'm just uh, working with that Esselman group here in Berkeley. It's gotten me out of that a lot more. Um, yeah, what's your name? No, I mean, it's nice. Where we live is quite nice. I'm a lot on the beach. I go to the ocean a lot. You dive in there, you can watch this. Whatever she is, coding you for the. You know. Oh, yeah. I know what you mean. Yeah. Um, yeah, 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 people are going to come in, they're going to come in. Huh? You know, should we start something? Sure. No? Start something. Okay, five minutes. But I want, I want everyone to sit around this table, if you would. Because we don't have a big crowd here. I'm not teaching this class. Come, come to the table. We're all gotta be to the table because I see who this crowd is. Uh, it's a march. Uh, UK watching. It's a march to for the University of California to divest from fossil fuels. Will that be a problem? Yeah, for the moment. Oh sure. It's just blowing high air on me. I can blow it. Let me. Let. No problem. I want to do my homework. Oh uh, yeah, it's the um, it's called fossil. I'm sorry, I'm talking to people online here. Uh, no, I think we have to have a different discussion. Given it's on Facebook at, at Fossil Free Cal. No, I mean I, I know I know one two three. I don't know. Have we ever met? There you go. My name is Ethan. Okay, I've been gone for a lot long time. Um, you want to sit at the table with us, my friend? Come on up. To you with the hat. Is there any room? Yeah, yeah pull, up, pull, up, pull up a chair. Pull up a chair. I'm looking at a whole lot of veterans here. Is what I'm looking at. You're not going to sit with us? I might have to leave before. I might have to leave before. No. I wouldn't focus that camera on me. I want everyone else to talk. I know, but I was here first. Put it over here on this side. There's plenty of room here. That's okay. He asked us to come up. That's okay. It's okay. Join us. No arguing yet. Do you want to sit over here, please? What's your name? He's just very rude. Uh, okay. You won't change that. I don't think he's rude. Guys, everybody. This is part of the impression that I feel as a person of color. Uh, uh, that's 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 I feel like I'm teaching a class, but I think you folks have much more to teach me than I have to teach you. It's my feeling. This, this holds in our line. We need a strong line to move forward together somehow. Okay. We all here? Yeah, I'm What? As you want. I know myself better than you do, though, I think. I am. I'm what? What? I'm never. I'm Billy, yeah. Are you Billy? No. What's your name? Me? Yeah. Greta. Greta. Okay, Billy, Billy comes from New York. New York. Most of the comedians that are famous come from New York. <laughs> I don't know who he's talking about. Another fight gets started. Oh, uh, no, that's, that's fine. Now, 
Uh, let me read what this says <laughs> to figure out what we're doing tonight. From divestment to well or divestment. I gave her that, that name. I was very active in the anti-apartheid movement back in the 1980s. Um, I actually was in school in the 1970s but dropped out and I would have been active there had been an earlier movement for divestment, anti-apartheid movement in the, uh, you, I think we're all old enough to remember that. Might be so long ago that it's hard to remember, but in the 70s when the Soweto uprising happened in South Africa. Everyone know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. I think that's the kind of crowd we have here. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to have to footnote anything. Um, but I was active in the 1980s. I was living in the Bay Area. I had moved here. I had been living in San Diego, although as Steve said, I'm from New York. Um, I had started a bakery there called Rebel Bakers. It was a collective bakery in San Diego. And I remember one time we made a cook. We, we tended to, to name our, our, we made all sorts of healthy things, things that I, I couldn't probably digest now. But um, <laughs> um, we were way ahead of our time in that and being sort of, I remember making some of those recipes years later and having to add like a pound of butter to everything. And, but um, it was a natural foods bakery. Um, and we, ha we were called Rebel Bakers. And we, made, we named cookies and things after people. So I had a girlfriend who was working there with me, started the bakery with me, called Nanny. And we had a cookie called the Pecan Nanny. And I'll always remember one day these folks came in. They, I saw them. We had a big glass window. It was probably, I mean, you know, windows are glass. Um, front window like that, and they looked at it and they saw Rebel Bakers. There was a big red star on it too, but I, I, I don't know how they, what they did with that in their heads, but they came in and in this really strong southern accent, the woman said, it's so, so great to, to see some place like this, thinking, you know, the Rebel, the rebel South. That was, and they said they had seen my, those cookies, Pecan Nannies, over there thinking, <laughs> thinking pick, pick a nanny, right? And, and so, but I'll always remember as she was speaking, she was looking around at the walls. And I, you know, we maybe had a Ho Chi Minh poster from Vietnam. This is in the late 70s. No, this is in 19, 1980. And then I always remember her, because I was watching her, she was talking, and she saw a poster that was Martin Luther King and then Malcolm X. And she just stopped in mid-sentence. <laughs> and she grabbed her mate there, her husband, I don't know, and, and, and pointed into that. And without another word, they walked out. But anyway, I came up here to the Bay Area. And, I, and, and, and you all remember, we all were probably active, most of us in the 1980s. Uh, Reagan had been elected. Uh, and... Uh, even though we probably felt like we were quite distant from the 60s. Now that I look back on that time and the students that I'm working with now on campus, I see we had so much more connection to that earlier time than these students have to ten, even 10 years ago. It was like a huge gulf for them. And certainly going back 20 years, they have no idea what happened. You know, I think the 60s, there's probably many people here who were very involved in that, but that was very much those, maybe the lessons weren't clear, but that spirit and that time was very much part of everything we did in the 80s. And a lot of folks were around, you know, who had been active at that time. And, and some of them were, if they had been 20 in 1969, so that was just, you know, 15 years later, 11 years later. So they were only, they were in their 30s. I'm now 57, and I'm working with these students on campus, and you know it's a much bigger gap. I think in the 80s we didn't realize how a lot of the elements from the 60s, even though society had changed a lot, you know, and, and a lot of you know the momentum and the direction of things was quite different. We had a lot of you still around, you know, and when we started the anti-apartheid organizing in the 84 when the new uprising came up in, in South Africa, we had so many people around. I mean, remember, you know, Michael Rossman and Mario Savio, and, 
And they weren't just these speakers who spoke at a rally. They were standing with us in the meetings and <coughs> often giving advice and weighing in. And they had a lot of experience and a lot of wisdom. Um, and why am I talking about the 80s? Oh, so I was involved in the divestment <coughs> movement. We, we decided, uh, even though there were people in the anti-apartheid movement on the left who disagreed with divestment as a tactic or a strategy, they saw it as too reformist or something, you know, not revolutionary enough, uh, we thought that was a good strategy at the university, um, you know, to have something, to have some demand. When I look at Occupy, I was in South Africa at the time. I've been, I was, before I came back last year to the United States, I was in South Africa for six years. Uh, yeah, I think during the time of the Occupy, definitely. And at least at a distance, we didn't hear about any demands. And I thought, that's a, that's a, difficult, that's a difficult fight when you're not actually asking for anything, you know, how to measure what your progress is. I guess, you're mostly measuring it in terms of how many people are out there. Um, but, you know, I, I always felt that our strength in the anti-apartheid movement is that we had something that we could fight for and we could focus on. And, we, and even though the authorities would try to distract us from that by bringing up all sorts of other things, and why don't you work on this or fight for that, we always said, no, we want the regions to be best. Um, and, and now I've returned here, it's 30 years later almost, um, to the United States. I was overseas as a journalist for about 20 years, um, maybe close, about 18. I'm working, I work in Africa, a number of countries. I work in Asia, uh, especially in Southeast Asia. I spent a lot of time, I don't know how I fell in with them, those of you who know me will know, with, with rebels of different sorts fighting you know, the main thing was for independence. It wasn't really a left wing. Most of them, I wouldn't say, are, were very left. But I guess I had grown up in that time of the 60s of national liberation struggles. And at that time, and through the 70s, most of them were socialistic in some ways. We maybe had criticisms of them, um, usually easy to make when you're far away from the situation. Um, but but uh, so I fell in as a journalist with different rebel groups. I was in East Timor. Most of you, everyone know what East Timor was, yeah. Uh, when they got independence, I was there in their first demonstrations after Suharto, who was the long-standing dictator in, in Indonesia, was pushed from power, essentially by the military. Um, and I was in East Timor when the first tentative demonstrations as people sort of left the campus looking around for the soldiers who they assumed were going to be shooting them down and they weren't there and watching it become this huge thing until eventually they want to vote to, to get independence. Um, so I had been overseas in with that and for 20 years and I came back and um, just about a year and a half ago and I had really not been doing any political, I mean, I'd been a journalist and I'd been making films and writing articles, mainstream papers, often under pseudonyms, um, uh, because I didn't want the, usually the government there to know who it was that was reporting from rebel-held mm -hmm. zones. Um, and I really hadn't done, when I came back, I really had not done any political work, organizing work, activism as it's now called. Um, in, in a long, long time. And um, I think, you know, I was going to talk about things that happened to me and things that I did, but I think looking at who's sitting here um, and, and seeing how I'm coming back after this long hiatus from the United States and from activism and organizing, you know, the question to me is how, you know, how I, how have I changed? And, 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 and I thought it would be very difficult for me to get back involved in things because I think I've changed in, in many ways, in ways that <coughs> making me less susceptible to being involved. And I see we have sort of a grayer crowd. I've got, some, I've got the gray hairs here too. Um, but it, the question to me is how those of us here veterans 
How, and, and many, maybe most of you have stayed involved over the years um, in a way that I haven't. But how do we, how do we sustain that activism, or how do we get back into it when we've probably changed quite a bit? I mean, to, to just in short, for me, I would say things have happened that make me less optimistic about our ability to not only change things, but to sustain those changes. Um, I think, you know, my whole life, I got it very early on when we took over the administration building in high school in 1970 with these Black Panthers and other anti-war protesters. You know, when something bad is going on, I always believe, just get in the way, you know. Uh, m m some of you might know me from Concord Naval Weapons Station when Brian Wilson was run over. Three days later, all of us went out there, probably 10,000. Some of us, including me, I brought special railroad tools, um, and we ripped up a lot of the track. Um, and so that's sort of been my guiding thing. And I'm different, I think, than certain kind of, what are they called, the people that are hammering on the nose cones? What do you, you know, um, what's that group? Flower shears. Flower shears type shears. people. I, I always tried to get a lot of people doing it, you know. And I always believed that if I was going to ask someone to do something, that I'd be part of it you know, that you have to sort of lead from the front. But I always believed the thing was to try and get a lot of people to do those, to do the most militant thing possible with a lot of people, and how to figure out how to get that right balance of lots of people and militancy. And the trick is sort of how to bring them along at the same time. I think we're all sort of, you know, struggling with that, and, and I know that's a bit, always a big debate in movements, you know, well, if we have, well, if we want to get a lot of people, well, we, we have to have the lowest common denominator. And then other people saying, well, if we just march down the street and don't block something or do, do something more active, uh, then, you know, we're not being very effective. So how to bring those two things together. So that's sort of been my philosophy. Get in the way, but get in the way with as many people as possible. Um, but get in the way in any case. In, in, in a way that will allow other people to be involved, you know. Um, and coming back now, I, I, I've lost, I would say, most of my optimism about really changing the society. You know, I, 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 I have to admit that. Um, at the same time, as I'm getting involved with these students on campus, I was pretty down when I came back. I came back to look after my parents who were both very ill and they both died within a few months of each other. Um, and I looked after them both for the last nine months, you know, and both of them died in my arms. Um, and, you know, probably most of our parents are looking around, probably not alive. Maybe you, have, you were fortunate and they didn't die at the same time. I think that's fortunate not to have that happen. But it really shook the ground out from under me. I really had to ask myself, given a lot of the new pessimism I had, and I'll talk about how that's come to be, what was worth doing after my parents died? And I had this realization that a lot of what I did, even though my parents didn't always agree with this, yes. you know, uh, a lot of what I did, they were sort of a first audience in a way. You know, it was like, if, if I'm going to be protesting at least, and, and being an activist, at least it has to be successful or on a high enough level that my parents will say, well, he's not, you know, a professor or anything, but he is a successful demonstrator, <laughs> you know, the, the bourgeois ethic, I mean, of success. But it didn't matter what, you know, it could be making weapons or it could be, but so they, I, I could tell they respected me because I had been respected by people. I had been seen as a leader. I had a, the ability to sort of bring people together to the table, even when some of us were crazy and, and some of us really disagreed with some of the others. I had to sustain that and keep a group, you know, in a movement moving forward. Um, but, you know, as I said, the, the question that I want to ask all of you is, you know, I don't know whether you've stayed involved for a long time or gone away from it and come back. How do you, 
how do you sustain your involvement or how do you keep going when um, maybe a lot of the things have shifted in your mind? So I, I think probably things are more fucked up than they ever were, you know? Mm -hmm. That's probably not true. I mean, it always seems, you know, when you're growing up, like when I see movies that are in black and white and set in New York, uh, New York City in the early 60s or late 50s, something about that affects me on a deep level that I can't even say. And I, I, I like those movies and I like that time and I think of it as a really wonderful time, even though a lot of the world was, you know, under colonialism and coming out of World War II and, you know, it was the Cold War, one of the high points of the Cold War. Um, but, um, so, yeah, probably today we've made a lot of advances, but we pro I probably think that society in some way has as many problems as it did back then. Maybe they're different, maybe they're new ones. I mean, the global warming thing, I was looking at the newspaper, going back in the, uh, the library here, looking at the Daily Cal from Berkeley, you know, it's their mm -hmm. campus newspaper. And it was interesting to me to see there in 1979 and all the articles I'm looking through, already there's talk about global warming. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was just seen as rising carbon levels, you know, CO2 levels. Uh, and no one really made, I mean, very few people made a big deal about it, you know. It was, pollution was more important and the ozone was more important. But there was that issue that was there. So that clearly, for me, it's a major change in the world. And I think we're facing sort of a civilizational, you know, uh, what's the word? Uh, you know, That's crisis, right. you know, that beyond, be, beyond anything that we maybe faced, that human beings have faced mm -hmm. in our lives. Um, I tend to be pessimistic about it. I tend to feel that that it's probably too late, but for some reason I find myself throwing myself into this work with the students on campus around, and their demand is for divestment. And I think that's helped me get back involved. And I think the fact that global warming seems to transcend or feed on all these other things and probably exacerbate, or certainly exacerbates them and will exacerbate <coughs> It's made it easy to get back involved. I don't think I'd be involved in anything, actually, now that I'm talking. I don't think I would have gotten back involved just in those last few months with anything. Um, as I said, I, I had a real crisis after my parents died. It really made me think what was worth doing. What, what were the things? So I've been working on a book that I mostly wrote 15 years ago, and I'm trying now to finish my mother in the last month or so of her life, said, Billy, what about that book that you wrote? Why don't you do something with that? So this is about the anti-apartheid movement in the United States. So I'm back doing that. But I think only global warming, and maybe that there's a specific thing, something about that appeals to me, this divestment thing. And the campuses, as we know, it's a very easy place to organize, you know, I think. I don't know whether you disagree. Maybe the easiest place. Because it's one of the few places in our society where we still have a community, a very tight community, where people, you know, they're going to, even though they're only there for three or four or five or graduate students for seven years, the students, they're there, and it's very easy to get things going. You know, you have a captive audience in a way, and an audience not only captive, but it has a has a lot of unstructured time. They have a lot more work than we did probably 30 years ago in school. And they have, the, you know, they have the classes to go to. But I think of it as very easy. So this is a long introduction to saying, I think I've only gotten involved given this, <coughs> this change in me. And, and, you know, because this was about global warming and about divestment something very specific. Let me just say one last thing, and I want, other, I want people to speak up. I've talked for a while, um, and maybe you ask me some questions, whatever. Maybe I'm rambling. Um, uh, what was I going to say? Um, the other changes in me. I, I spent a lot of time in the third, what we used to call the third world. I guess it's called the global south now, right? I still call it the third world. Who here calls it the third world still? No. Global South now? What do you call it? 
the third um, world. The developing world. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Well, we used to not call it the developing world because we say it's actually being underdeveloped or un that it wasn't developing. That capitalism and imperialism was all about developing one part and underdeveloping uh, another part. But, you know. Emerging markets. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's an interesting. But, I mean, we weren't right. We weren't right about the third world. We were wrong because a lot of areas have changed, you know, and have developed and have become first world, what we call first world countries. The second world was the communist world. That doesn't, well, I guess there's a couple of countries or one country, right? Uh, North Korea. I'm putting quotes around the communists, you know. Um, but, um, I mean, we're, I, I think that I was wrong about a lot of things, you know. And, and it, just like someone standing at 1901 could never, in his, his or her wildest imagination, come up with what happened in the rest of the 20th century. So I think that when I first became political in the early 70s, if I could have sort of laid out what was going to happen in the world, I, you know, <laughs> it's like once things go a little bit differently than you think, then they go a little bit differently again and again. And, and, and really, the course of history is very, very different than you imagine. And because I'm looking back at a lot of these old newspapers, I see a lot of the sort of, not, they're not exactly predictions, but they're sort of spelling out how they think it's going to be. And I, I think they're almost all entirely wrong. Anyway, um, so I, I want people to talk some, maybe Steve is going to ask me some questions though tonight about, um, you know, how you've changed over time and how, if you continue to be active, how, how you have sustained that in the face of what for me is, you know, as people said, well, if, you're, if you're not a radical in your 20s, you're something wrong with you, and if you're not a conservative in your 40s, or, um, but, I mean, I'm not, but I think I'm, le as I said, less optimistic about being able to change things, and realizing that a lot of the things start, I know this is go against all the left-wing thinking, start with individuals, and individuals doing wrong. And some, I'm not going to say there's a kind of human nature that we have, but I've seen so many things just, just around with, with my family members, with friends, people I've fallen out with, or mostly who have fallen out with me, things that they've done that have really shocked me in a way that made me, you know, much more cynical and much less, and also believing that the problem often, I can now see how social problems come from how we act as individuals. I'll give an example of that and then I'll take the questions. When my parents died, they left some money and I ha my parents owned a house, okay? and. There were three of us, and my sister, who was the best off of all of us, she's a professor at Harvard, and you know, has got a house in Cape Cod and a house in Brooklyn. She made a real effort to take as much of that money and, and take that house, and did so many things to my brother and, and, and me. Um, that I wouldn't have done to my worst enemy. She used all, I've been arrested probably 20 times. She used those arrests in the United States and then my arrest as a journalist overseas to show that I was violent, to show that I was unstable and sort of crazy, and that someone else needed to manage my affairs, and that someone else would be her, the law professor at Harvard. Um, and she actually brought me to court using these arrests to say I couldn't even I couldn't even be near that house. That so my, the intention of my brother and myself was to sell that house and to split the profits of it three ways. But that mm -hmm. my sister wanted that house, and she was determined to ma you know to make sure that we that she had control of it. She went so far that when my father was in his last few months, when I would go out and buy things, and this would be, you know, credited toward the um, the estate, 
that she called me on the phone, why are you buying extra this clothing and why are you taking him out to dinners? Um, and she was afraid that we were going to have to sell the house in order to support my father, who was there with Parkinson's, etc. Um, so anyway, that's one of the things, the kind of personal things that happened to me that made me see that once my sister, once she did wrong to me and couldn't be man or woman enough to say, I'm sorry, I did wrong and let's move forward, that she had to lie to people. She was afraid I would tell people that what she tried to do, how she tried to take the house. And she had to, so she told, Billy's only back looking after our father because he is stealing from him and he is actually physically abusing him um, to make me look bad. So I just saw how my sister from one small wrong had to build a whole edifice of lies and deceit and I thought this was so much like a, di a politician, a dictator who gets into power, who people want to criticize. He, him or her, mostly him, uh, and that person doesn't want to be exposed, so has to suppress that initial protest against, and how this just builds up, you know, an attempt to contain it, you not only have to lie, sort of lies built on repression, on lying, so this has been the shift for me, you know, in seeing how us as individuals, even a sister that I was very close to, was capable of doing such terrible things. So how could I ever believe that we could make a better world, you know? Um, and I know all the arguments against that, you know, well, this is capitalism, or this is this, you know? But, so that's where I am. Um, I've talked for a long time. Uh, you know, I'm just trying to give you, to understand where I'm coming from now and, and, and what I feel and I'm struggling with a lot of things. Um, anyway. Hey, thanks for sharing that with us. Uh, during the free speech movement uh, commemoration, Billy has been around for quite a lot of work, so uh, a lot of us went to a program on the anti-apartheid divestment the program was filmed and uh, speak up a little bit. Okay, and uh, I, when I got a chance to say something, I said, you know, when I walked into this room, there were probably 100 people. I said, I got some questions, but, but before that, I, I just saw this bright light, and there he was, Billy Ness. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> uh, for me, he's always been a bright light. But anyway, the, uh, you know, we have a lot of time to talk about what we're going to do Wednesday in, in, yeah. in, in the present and the future. But just some things about the past. We did show a film here um, um, about the uh, anti-apartheid divestment. Oh, the, from Soweto to Berkeley. Berkeley. Yeah. yeah, and Andrea Pritchett was here, and um, and Gerald Smith, and that was very informative. But you know, um, as I understood it, you were one of the initiators of the whole thing, and you didn't you? I mean, you're very creative as well. <coughs> with it. You know actions and so forth. Tactics and that. Did you bring the shanties on campus and they tore them down and then they brought them back and built them? Uh, was, that, was that your... Well, uh, our group, I mean, why? the thing about the anti-apartheid movement and our, you know, the time that a lot of us grew up in, they were solidarity movements, really. You know, victory to the, the Vietnamese, you know, the rebellions and all these colonies and neo-colonies, whatever we're going to call them, um, they were solidarity movements. And South Africa, to me, is one of the last of a long line, sort of the end of that age, of the age of national liberation. It was a little different because the white people weren't going to go anywhere. I mean, the French left Algeria in the early 60s, and the British left Kenya, and the Portuguese left Angola and such. But, and whites ended up leaving Rhodesia, Zimbabwe, but it seemed pretty likely at a certain point that the whites were going to stay there, but it's still part of that national liberation struggle. And so our, the, the timing of the movement, the, the, the transformation of what I would call activism into movements in the United States, very much was timed to what was happening in South Africa. When they rose up, 
we rose up. Um, and so that, that period in 84, things had happened in South Africa, and there was a new surge of protest in the townships. Um, and we started what was called the, the Campaign Against Apartheid. That was the name of our organization. And we started, it was me and Bradley Angel, do people know who's yeah. at Green Action? And he was with um, All People's Congress then. He was more of the independent-minded. Um, and Mickey Ellinger, maybe people know, who had been in Prairie Fire. Uh, um, and then just one student. She, was, she worked on campus. So there was really three of us, Mickey and Bradley and myself. And we, we started it, you know, in that fall. And maybe many of you were over there. And the, by the next spring, we had this long sit-in. Uh, the administration let us sit there mistakenly for six days. By the time they arrested us, uh, people were really pissed off. And so where once stood or sat 140 people, all of a sudden it was 5,000 people there, you know, who watched us being dragged to the buses and such and tried to block the buses. Um, and so that was the first year. It was a 43-day. So we took the steps and we had rallies every day and we had famous speakers so what was the coming. the year, the actual year? 84 to 85. So that was 84 to 85. And, and both we, Steve, both we and the administration learned a lesson from that first year. And for them, the lesson was, don't let people stay even one night there. Because <laughs> once they do, it gives it a legitimacy. Because if you bust them the next day, people are going to say, they weren't interfering, they were fine there the day before. So actually, since 1985, the University of California, Berkeley, has not allowed anyone to sleep on that campus, I mean, besides in the library. Um, <laughs> out on the pl any of the plazas. And when Occupy tried it, that's what you know, stirred things up if you folks were there. People tried to put some tents down, and then the police came in to try and get the tents, and people made a circle around and linked arms. And that, of course, pisses off the university, because if you link arms being nonviolent, it really presents a beautiful dilemma for the authorities. Either they have to let you stay, or they have to use violence against you which usually works in our favor. But so they learned, don't let anyone stay there. And we learned that these long sit-ins are problematic. And if anyone, people were involved in Occupy. And I even saw that reading stuff from afar when I was in South Africa, that there were a lot of social problems in those long encampments. And, and, and maybe people, I don't know, but the lesson I got is people shouldn't blame themselves for those problems. And most of the problems of our movement, we can't really blame ourselves at that particular time. They're general problems that we have. They're, they're you know, the whole society is going to be there, especially the most exposed, the poorest people, the people with the least, maybe people with a lot of problems will be attracted, as they should be, to those encampments. So we learned also that it wasn't really, we don't want to do it again. And we knew the university wouldn't let us do it again. But it took us a while to learn that. In the, in the fall of 1985, after the first nine months of sit-ins and, and, and the long sit-in, we had many, many demonstrations. We tried to get inside buildings, and we had lots of confrontations. There were dozens of demonstrations. And at a certain point during that winter, 85 going to 86, it clicked in us of what we had to do. Shanties already have been used a little bit on some campuses at Cornell, Dartmouth. People had set up shanties. At Dartmouth, the right-wing students had come and knocked them down during the night, and it got a lot of publicity, if people remember that. So, and even in the first year, some of the people who had been on what was called the steps, the Biko steps, um, had brought shanties to a demonstration in the city. Um, Andy Brody, if any people know, know him, uh, Rose Braz, another organizer. Um, they had had the, what's called the Steps Group, and they had brought the shanties as a symbol um, to, to demonstration. <coughs> so we had an idea. We thought, what are we going to do? How, how can we build up that sense of we have legitimacy, 
how do we build something so that people are going to be mad if we're attacked? You know, we're not going to have a week to sit around and people are going to see us there and say how committed they are and hear all the speeches and yeah. You know. So we thought we'll use the shanties to create very quickly something that would attract people that so, sort of establishes our place. But we knew the administration would send the police there the, the first night. So we said, okay, and it wasn't really my idea. Let's put it in the middle of the campus, not over there in Sproul, but right, sort of right in front of the chan we, chancellor's office was there in California Hall. It didn't really, it, that helped us, but we're going to put it in the middle of the campus. We'll have enough people arrested the first night. And when they come with their buses or police to take us to Santa Rita, what we called, I think the 10th, UC Santa Rita we called it. Um, yeah. But, but, but um, we said then we're going to surround the police. That, that was our simple thing. They're going to come arrest us and we have enough people that then we're going to surround them. So the first night was sort of the most militant of us. We, we had built these shanties, some of which we called fortress shanties. Because they were literally, they were bolted in and like riveted down, or I don't know what's the right word, you know, with screws and everything. They were, they were solid. You couldn't just tear them apart. So there were about, about 60 of us arrested the first night, and there were attempts to block the buses as they went out. Someone rode a dumpster down at the police at some point. I think he was arrested two days later. Assault with a deadly dumpster <laughs> was the charge against him. And in stories years later, you see, oh, there was a fl the thing was a flame and this and that. It wasn't true. But so we were arrested. They made the mistake then of letting us, the most militant 50 or so, out of jail the next day. <laughs> I was banned, about five others, Aaron Aaron's, about six or seven others of us were banned from campus. Um, and, um, but we came on anyway. And so we rebuilt the shanty town. Um, I remember in, in the rally, to help us get momentum, we had Alice Coltrane playing, John Coltrane's wife. We brought a grand piano out onto the steps. We had, um, uh, you know, uh, what's his name? Freedom. Uh, Richie Havens, Richie Havens oh, wow. played for us. I remember watching him in the first rally and just watching his foot tapping. I said, my God, if I could just tap my foot the way he tapped, <laughs> I'd be happy. You know, he was so good. But so, and then we were have, I think, you Masakela. Mm. And, and anyway, so we had all these superstars. And so the second, two days later, we rebuilt the shanty town. And the police, their thing was, do not arrest during the daytime. They don't want to arrest because the thing about a campus and why you want to, as students, you want to stay on campus is that other people can see it. And that's what they don't want. That's why they're now holding all the regents meetings in San Francisco. They used to rotate it on all the campuses. And I've gone back and looked in the Daily Cal and I've seen that every few years after there have been a lot of protests, the regents stop meeting on all the campuses and they start, start meeting and SF, probably at some point they'll bring it back to the campuses. But, but anyway, so um, uh, the second night we built it, rebuilt the shanties. We knew that they wouldn't move on us during the day when all the students were around and we put, waited till the night. Nighttime came, another different group of people were inside. A lot of us who had already been arrested were outside and around, they brought in two buses and then eventually they brought in maybe 300 police from other, um, three or 400 police at, at one point uh, from 11 different departments. The Berkeley police, they had refused to uh, heed the, um, I figure out what it's called. Mutual aid. Mutual, Mutual aid. aid. They had refused, they had said ahead of time that they would not heed it and they didn't. They brought in Oakland police and Alameda sheriffs and um, they came in, they, they had a hard time bringing in the buses, people blocked them, we threw stuff at the buses. We've basically been nonviolent through the whole thing. That night actually was the change and looking back on it years later was a mistake that we made, I think. Um, but they brought in the buses and around that, around California, we built barricades from everything all over campus. We dragged 100 pound, 200 pound benches, garbage cans, bicycle racks. On the north side, we coated it all with paint 
so they couldn't touch it. You know, these police, they've got things all over the uniform. We really made it very difficult. In the end, it took them all night to arrest people. They had to, actually didn't have enough room on the buses, so they had to let a lot of people go. They didn't want to bring, try and bring in another bus because things had escalated. And it was already morning by the time they attempted to take the buses out. And what happened was a, as they, they dismantled the barricades, and then we sort of fought them across, the, retreating across the plaza to Bancroft and Telegraph. They brought the buses out. But we fought, and, and, um, and we felt good about it at the time. And a lot of people who haven't been in that kind of thing through a whole movement as things escalate don't understand how could you be throwing stuff. Mm -hmm. you know, and I, when I tell them that there were people there that night who would have sworn at the beginning of the night they would never throw anything. They were throwing stuff and handing me stuff, you know, to throw, and, and you know, it just people changed. And as I say, we look back on that time, and I think we made a mistake, because when we, what, by the time they got to the edge of campus, there were a lot of students coming up the avenue, and there we were throwing concrete and books and everything at the at the police, and some were going down, some were quite seriously injured. But if we had probably laid down there. Even though if we had been beat, it would have been easy. It was very hard for anyone to join at that level. Yeah. That was the thing. Mm -hmm. You know, you had to be already pretty angry or something, you know, mm -hmm. to pick up a brick and join us and start fighting the police there. Um, so that's what happened that night. And that's, and, and, and I think what, uh, let me just add this bit, that that was a real break. Not only did we start fighting back, but we stopped organizing, actually. We didn't realize that the more militant you are, the more organizing you have to do. And I got into a thing with sort of a group of people from Berkeley of just going to demonstrations and getting into fights with the police. And it was really a dead end, you know, and it, we increasingly were isolated from other people. And we weren't like the black flock, but I can see sort of the elements that we generated. And from then on, there were groups of sort of these protesters who were not connected the way we were to the organizers. So when we shut down the federal building, the first Gulf War, were people there? We shut down. And then people from uh, Prairie Fire and Ciscus came to me and said, we need to, we need to get you at the front. We want to go take over. We want to try and get on the bridge. So I got all those Berkeley militants at the front, and they set up a police line to try and stop us from getting on the bridge, and we just hit it really hard. And once some of us were through the lines, I don't know if people were there, once you're behind the police, they don't know what to do. And you just have to feel the weight of those thousands of people. But, but in the end, I was saying it was sort of a dead end, this, the strategy of just tactical militancy without doing the corresponding organizing. Like I think of a tree. The higher you want it to grow, the more beautiful, the deeper and stronger the roots need to be. And, and I think, so when I've gotten back in the divestment stuff again, we're saying you've got to protest, which they haven't done, but you've also got to go into the dorms and the co-ops and the classes and talk to people. Okay, eventually, yeah, we agreed that I would just interview him a little bit and then we'll have but eventually you see uh, divested 3.1 billion dollars yeah. and Nelson Mandela came here and spoke to 60 or 70 thousand people at the Oakland Coliseum and he was so thankful for the people of Berkeley and Oakland people like Billy and, and uh, Andrew Pritchard and all the activists and the, the Long Shore people yeah. for their strikes that it, it was, it was, it was a, a major um, contribution to the, uh, bring the end of apartheid. And, uh, okay, also, um, you know, I remember when you, uh, Billy was uh, traveling with the Aceh uh, guerrillas. Free Aceh movement. Movement, yeah, in Indonesia. The guerrillas. And uh, uh, we hadn't heard anything too much about it, but all of a sudden, in the front pages of the paper, Billy uh, was arrested and uh, in prison. Um, and we were all worried, you know, for his safety. And there was international outcry. I, I was looking for the, the papers today. I got so many papers I couldn't find them. <laughs> but anyway, uh, it was in the headlines and uh, we all tried to come to his aid and eventually 
I served. I was there for three months in prison, and then got out. Yeah, and and then, but maybe just just briefly talk about that. You know, that experience, and then yeah, and then I think the tsunami kind of yeah. Well, you know, Berkeley and the Bay Area really prepared me to be what I called an outdoor journalist. Even though I wrote for the mainstream papers, I really, uh, I stayed away from the path that most journalists took. Um, you know, you, I lived among the people. I ended up getting married with a woman who was my fixer. And she was actually a spy for the independence movement. What's a fixer? A fixer is someone who arranges things, fixes things for journalists. So I was a journalist. And most journalists, they, I mean all of them, would stay in the hotel and they'd go out in a rented vehicle you know, with her and go around and they'd get maybe an interview with a guerrilla commander and then come back. But, um, you know, I, I guess I, I wasn't afraid to sort of go away from the rest of the journalists. And I guess I was prepared. I thought that I was on the same wavelength with these guerrilla fighters, you know. I could have very easily have seen myself if I had been born there, and even if I hadn't been born there, joining the guerrillas. So it was not a big leap for me, you know. It was really in my blood from being here, you know, that I'm a rebel of some kind. I'm a dissident. I'm, you know, uh, willing to, to be with people or take a stand, uh, you know, with people who were fighting their own government. Um, so I spent a lot of time in the villages. In, you know, in Indonesia and a lot of countries, so they are, most of the people live outside the cities. And in Aceh province, which had been, it's, it's the northernmost part of Sumatra. So people know Indonesian geography a little bit. Indonesia is 17,000 islands, about half are inhabited, but it's spread over about 3,000 miles from East Timor and, and the, sort of the Melanesian South Pacific in the, uh, in the west. Um, do people know where, like, where, where, uh, where um, you know, Fiji? So Indonesia sort of sprinkles off there towards Fiji and Samoa and um, Tonga, uh, South the South Pacific, you know. And then in the west, it's, I mean, the east, it stretches all the way into the Indian Ocean so that Aceh is actually closer to Sri Lanka than it is to the capital of its own country. Is that west? I'm, I'm just trying to think. Oh, that's east. You're right. I'm sorry. So East Timor, east. Aceh West, so if we had Indonesia like this, and, and Sumatra is like this, and here's the Indian Ocean, and here's India and Sri Lanka. So when that tsunami actually hit, which was right next to Aceh, the other place that it affected besides Southeast Asia was Sri Lanka and India. Um, but, but so the Achenese were very, they were, they were, had long been in rebellion against the central government. Indonesia, um, it handled its, the problem of, of that, that great spread and differences in a very different way than, for example, India. India's got probably the loosest federal system in the world, where the states have a lot of individual power and the national government can't really interfere. So, so they've got, they've got us, maybe you can disagree with me, but I think I'm right. Um, for example, there are these rebels now, the, the Naxalites in central India, and their position right on the edge of, they operate in about three or different states, and so far they've stayed ahead of the government because they can go from one state into another, and the police from one state uh, hesitate to go into the other state, and the federal government hasn't been able to intervene. They're, they're changing that. But so they have a very loose system in India. Indonesia dealt with it by centralizing it um, in one place. Jakarta holds the power, and they don't. Whereas in India, you can have <coughs> political parties that are specific to a state. In Indonesia, you can't have a political party unless you're represented in in mo uh, like two thirds or three quarters of the provinces. So to be in there, here's. 
here's, um, here's Aceh, right here, and there's the Indian Ocean. And over here is the other part. This is about 3,000 miles across. And the capital is Jakarta here. Um, that's Shell. That's, that's Shell. That's just Shell. Anyway, so this is Indonesia in white. Um, uh, so Aceh had long been in rebellion against the central government since independence of Indonesia in, in 1948 from the Dutch after <coughs> World War II. Uh, so it was still a very rural area. The, the main cities didn't have that many people. And even if you lived in the city, you were still very much connected to your home. You know, your whole family, if you were in the city, you probably most of your family was still in the village. So I spent an enormous amount of time over about two years <coughs> in the villages of Aceh. And outside the main cities, the guerrillas controlled everything. You didn't necessarily see them there. But the moment you sort of went across the street, <laughs> that whole area was them. And, and most people, even journalists reporting from there, didn't realize that everyone around them was sort of was working with the guerrillas. There in East Timor, I saw... Um, what was the year of living dangerously when our CIA... Um, oh yeah, that was in the 60s, in 1965 and 66 in Indonesia, when there was a coup against the president, Sukarno, who was styled as a leftist of sorts, um, uh, but increasingly dictatorial. There was a military coup that brought Su Suharto to power, and uh, they killed, I think it had like, it had the largest communist party outside the communist uh, countries. And they killed, you know, a million people probably. Yeah, so it was all, and, and, um, and, and, and the, uh, I was actually on an aircraft carrier off the coast when that happened, on Shark. It was 30 ships. It was a time when the massacre started and the CIA provided 5,000 names to get a Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and he came out of Japan and... Um, so the, the, uh, the U.S. was involved. There's a recent documentary that's quite good where the filmmaker has gotten some of the actual killers <coughs> on the ground to reenact <coughs> the stuff. Yeah, the killers. The killers. The killers. Yeah. Anyway, so, so, I mean, it's a place of communist and, uh, and, and anti-communism, very strong, a lot of tension. Aceh had really stayed out of the main frames of Indonesia, because it, 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 um, it's very, you know when you looked at a map, in the 20th, in the 19th century, when you looked at a map and saw blue, or when you saw water, you thought connection, actually. And when you saw land, you thought no connection. It's very different today, when they started building roads. We look at it, and oh, okay, but I wish we had. See, this is this is very interesting. This is how Indonesia is normally shown on the map, but more properly would show it going here over to Africa, Saudi Arabia, India. Uh, that this was part of. This is a world of water, and and using the monsoon cycle, the timing, it was very easy to sail. That was much faster than going to, by land where there were no roads. So to, you have to get into the mindset of the times, and, and this map contributes to the impression that Aceh is part of Indonesia, when historically it was really part of something else. So the Dutch colonized all of this. But you know, in the 19th century, in a lot of places, they only had these sort of entrepôts, these port towns. And internally, where there's very few roads, that was just a whole other world, you know. Um, and here was probably the toughest fight for the Dutch. They never really controlled much of Aceh. And when World War II happened, the Japanese came in here. They also, the Achenese fought against them much more than any place else. In a lot of areas, the, the people, the independence people worked with the Japanese. The Achenese, because they didn't agree with being part of the Dutch East Indies already, and didn't like the Japanese, they fought them. And then after the Japanese were defeated and the Dutch started coming back, the only place where they didn't even try to come back was in Aceh. 
So for several years before the independence of Indonesia, three years, Aceh basically was ruling itself. And they agreed at a certain point when Sukarno said, we're going to, here's going to be Indonesia, we want you to be part of it. Actually, Sukarno and others fled here to Aceh during the Civil War from 45 to 48, because it was the only place outside, a little slice of Java that was outside Dutch control. And they had the, the independence radio station, the main one was based here. That was transmitting all over, uh, through, I mean, they had other stations, but this was the main thing where they put together shows and this and that. But, um, so this was independent, and when Indonesia became independent, they agreed to join it. But they, their conception of what that would be was sort of what they'd been enjoying for the last three years, that they were basically running their own show. And over the next several years, as Sukarno, he was a lefty, but he believed in a more centralized um, government, tried to control Aceh, they went into rebellion. So by the early 50s, they were in their first rebellion. That was put down. Then there was another rebellion in the early 60s, and then again in the 70s. So, so by the time I got there, in the, um, uh, when did I get there, 2000, they had been fighting off and on for years. And the thing about, uh, the thing about Aceh is that, you know, any guerrilla struggle, you need somewhere, a back area where you can be relatively safe and where money and guns can come from. So that's okay. So a lot of the Achenese during the 70s who had been in the guerrilla fight, they went there and brought their families over to Malaysia and were living here in Malaysia actually, right here. And so they set up shops and that's, and there was a lot of, you know, from the Vietnam War time, there were a lot of AK-47s flowing around here and you could buy them for like 70 or 80 dollars. You know, that was a relative lo a lot of money for them, but it was, you know, th they had a lot of shops and, and other businesses. So they bought thousands of these weapons and brought them to Aceh and prepared again um, for another rebellion. When Suharto was overthrown in 1998, when he was pushed out of power by the military and the West, really, they knew they had to put another face on the Indonesian economy. They went into rebellion here. The East Timorese, this is East Timor right here, the eastern half of that, went into rebellion. Oh, no, that's it. I'm sorry. This is East Timor right here. They went into rebellion. The Papuans, which is not on this map <coughs> here, was also in rebellion. So I got there. They were had an armed struggle going. They also had an independence a civilian independence movement operating, and I reported with them. I went into the villages and I spent many, many months up in the mountains with the guerrillas. Now, one thing I learned is that guerrillas don't like being, the guerrillas with G-U-E, they don't like being far off in the forest. They're not very strong. They, they stayed around the villages because that's, that's how they get their information. Guerrillas are very weak when they're pushed away from the main part of the population. Unless you're really sort of advanced the way like Colombian guerrillas are. They've got a lot of money from selling drugs. And they can actually live in the, in the forest and set up, you know, I mean, they've got all sorts of infrastructure there. But most guerrilla fighters, they stay around their village, especially where they're from, because they know they can trust their family. Um, there we are again. <laughs> See, this, this is very interesting. This, this is the world. So, uh, um, back up again. Islam came into Southeast Asia through Aceh. Mm -hmm. That's where it came. And, and it was called the veranda of Mecca. So people would gather here in the next several... It came in about 700, not that long after... Mm -hmm. So people would gather here. Sometimes you'd stay there for a year or two, getting your money together or whatever it is, studying enough, and then you went on the Hajj to, you know, by boat. You'd go to Saudi Arabia, to Mecca. So um, this was a very important place, but it was very much connected to the trade that was conducted in this area. This, there was no roads. This was, you know, they were connected to that, not to this. Um, 
Anyway, I'm going on and on. I don't even remember what you're listening to. Today, that was, that was great. But today, uh, we're, that tsunami kind of wiped out a lot of that area and kind of uh, it interrupted the... Uh, well, there's a guerrilla war that was going on. And at a certain point, which is when I got, um, I ended up uh, turning myself over to the military. I mean, I, I probably wouldn't have survived because most of the people I was with got killed in the next year or so. Um, probably 80% of the guerrilla fighters in my unit that I was with. Um, one of the most intense areas, but almost everybody got killed. But um, they had a, 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 a they declared martial law in the province. It had already been sort of under the military, declared martial law, and brought in like 60,000 troops. And it's not a big area. And they basically occupied. What you have to do if you're suppressing a rebellion is you've got to <coughs> occupy all the villages and the towns, you know, and, and, and have a base. You're in every place. And you have to start controlling the civilian population and their movement. So at a certain point, the guerrillas couldn't get any support from people in the villages. Uh, all, all goods that were sold in the shops, they'd have an Indonesian soldier there saying, okay, your family has four people, so you get this much rice. If you bought any more, you'd be arrested. You know, they'd suspect you. Uh, if you bought, the, all the guerrillas smoked. It was the, probably the worst thing about it. Um, I mean, there was just smoke everywhere. I, was, I thought, wow, I'm in the jungle here. There's like tigers and elephants. And, you know, I, just, I could barely breathe sometimes. Uh, um, but but um, so they clamped down, and um, it made it very difficult. And I ended up um, giving myself up. But... Uh, and I went to prison for a few months. I was put on trial. Uh, initially, they said they were going to try me for treason uh, and then for spying. And eventually, it was just sort of, you know, uh, I didn't have the correct, well, I had the correct visa. I didn't have some stamp that they said I should ha have. Um, and I was released. And the struggle continued. And then um, in 2003 or 2004, the tsunami hit just right, it was just about 50 kilometers off of Aceh here. 200,000 people were killed. And I'll tell you a story. <coughs> After that, so when I was kicked out, I was banned from Indonesia. They weren't going to let me come back. Um, but when the tsunami happened and people from all over the world came, the military, I got in and I got back into the province and I was able to, um, if people, we watched some of my film, You'll see I come back after the tsunami. But one of the terrible stories that I found was that right on this coast, where I had spent a lot of time with the guerrillas that were based here, what happened is that the military, in order to control the rebellion, the, the guerrillas, to cut them off, they had moved a lot of the people who were up away from the coast down to camps uh, right on the coast. So when the tsunami hit, and this was the hardest, the heaviest hit. It killed all these people. People didn't, I was the only journalist to, to sort of realize that and write about it. They couldn't understand why so many people died over here when most of the people were up, had been up several miles inland. How did they all die? Well, they died because the, they had been put into these camps there. Um, and, and that was sort of the convergence of the rebellion, of the suppression, and the tsunami. Um, a lot of people I knew. Um, but um, So the tsunami happened and the guerrillas decided they had been worn down considerably. As I say, within another year, probably mo a large part of the number of the people, I, the guerrilla fighters I was with, had been killed. But they decided, the leadership, some of whom were in exile in Sweden, they thought We've, people have suffered too much. You know, um, They could continue fighting another day. But they, 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 they said, look, we've got to stop it and, and sort of make the most of what we can here. Um, and they, for the first time, um, they were, Aceh was allowed to have a local political party. No other place in Indonesia can you have a par political party that's just from one province. And that's, that's the, the best thing that they won. And so they ran for office, and they were not allowed to run as the Free Aceh Movement. 
They were not allowed to use the same symbols that they used as the guerrilla or independence movement. But they won in the vote. My, one of my best friends who was arrested in a house I had in Jakarta, um, he became the governor of the province, my closest friend there. Um, and, um, you know, as always happens, started to buy. You sound, you sound a little like Che, che Guevara traveling around. Yeah, whatever. I mean, <laughs> so, 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 so the division, here are people that have worked together for 20 or 30 years. All of a sudden, there's a bit of power and some access to this and that and divisions. So he got reelected the first time, the next time, and then the party just split in two. And he was voted out the next time. And other folks are in. He's much less confident. But the other thing that I saw there is how corruption, how it sort of reemerged. So first, what he would do is people would come to be contracts to build a road or do something. The governor had a lot of power on who got those contracts and the parliament. And they tended to give them, they'd give them to people whose families had suffered, whose families had fought for independence. They didn't give it to people from outside the province or people who had been on the government side. But then the people who did that, who got those contracts, they didn't always do a good job. So, you know, like money disappeared, the road didn't get built, shit, you know. So increasingly there was sort of you know, from a kind of nepotism that you could understand, there was increased corruption. You were paying money to get the contracts, and, and it just became, you know, um, very, something very familiar to all of us, you know, what happens in, in, in countries where there's, you know, people fighting over very little. Unfortunately, they don't always rally together. They often divide and, you know, try and make the best of it. Um, well, just since we're occupying, I want to put corruption in perspective since we have a little bit of it here in San Francisco. Um, uh, uh, people should know that uh, the military spending, Diane Feinstein has a contributor who makes the triggers for the rifles that they sell through INET, which is International Military and Education <laughs> Training. Okay. Well, and then yeah. also, basically, you know, the reason they have so hard to, et cetera, is Indonesia has been the poster country in Asia for World Bank, IMF. So they run up these huge loans, okay, and Bechtel, which has moved from San Francisco to the D.C. area, right, they just collect off those big contracts, which are now a lot of USAID and DOD. So I just want to put in perspective, because, you know, the third world countries are often portrayed that, well, they're poor, they're brown, they're corrupt, da da da, da. But it trickles down. That I believe in. Trickle down corruption. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't disagree with that. I'm just, you know, when you go to places, you end up sort of focusing on what happens there, and you actually, you lose a kind of perspective that maybe you maintain about a place when you have some distance. Paul Wolfowitz loves Indonesia. Yeah. They're such nice little people. <laughs> um, yeah, we can open up. No, I, mean, I, I, you know, I started by talking, but 